hip relaxation. Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Susie Roy, the Customer Relations Manager for the Americas and the Research Engagement Lead here at SNOMED International and your host for today. I'm very excited to welcome you all to the SNOMED CT research webinar this month. Uh, this webinar is where we showcase research on or with SNOMED CT. Just a couple of really quick housekeeping items before we begin. You'll notice that everyone is currently muted. If you have questions as we go along, go ahead and enter your questions into the Q&A box. When we get to the Q&A portion, I'll be sure to call on you first. Also at that time, if you raise your hand, I can unmute you and you can ask your question to Dr. Cornett. Um, as you heard, this webinar is being recorded, um, and that's because after the webinar is completed, you'll be able to view the video and download the slides and watch this video again or pass it along to your colleagues. I wanted to go ahead and encourage you all to save the date, Wednesday, uh, August 19th, for our next research webinar. I'm so incredibly excited to announce that Dr. Hyune Park of Seoul National University will be presenting. Um, if you can't tell, I'm just a little excited for Dr. Park's webinar next month. I'm a huge fan of her and her work. Um, her work uh, often involves uh, healthcare big data analytics and investigating ways to predict the occurrence of uh, patient safety problems. So watch for this announcement for next month's research webinar. Um, it should be a good one. Also, um, as part of the SNOMED CT web series, we have another track for uh, clinical um, implementation um, presentations, and that one's our clinical web series. Our August um, webinar has not yet been announced, but stay tuned and watch for that. Um, if you wanted to stay informed for the SNOMED CT uh, research webinar, you can either watch that SNOMED CT web series webpage or you can sign up for the research reference group. Um, this research reference group is just where I post information about all of these uh, research web series um, or any other SNOMED CT research related news. Uh, to join, all you have to do is email me, Susie, SRO at snomed.org, and I will get you on that list. Uh, one last little bit of information before I hand this over to our presenter for the day. Um, I wanted to do a little plug for our annual SNOMED CT Expo, and uh, this is actually hot off the presses. Registration will open later today for our October Expo meeting. Um, this year we are running a virtual event, so all of our business meetings and our expo will be all virtual. Registration uh, is opening, like I said, today. Uh, the program and schedule will also be posted as uh, we go along, so save these dates, register, and looking forward to seeing you all there in October virtually. Okay, enough of my speaking because I know you've actually all come here to listen to our presenter for the day. I have the absolute honor in introducing Dr. Ronald Cornett. Dr. Cornett holds a position as Associate Professor at the Department of Medical Informatics in the Amsterdam Public Health Research Institute, Amsterdam, UMC, University of Amsterdam. His research focuses on semantic interoperability, both from a technical and a user's point of view, including natural language processing. Today, Dr. Cornett will be presenting SNOMED CT, OWL in a Fair Web of Data. And with that, I will send it over to you, Ron. Thank you very much. Um, so I will take over the screen and I hope that if things work, work out, you will now see my title slide. Yes. Great. Um, yes, so then I've got everything in place. Um, thank you very much for the introduction, Susie, and it's a, it's a great pleasure to, to be able to, to give this presentation. Uh, to me, it feels like almost a, a, a warming up for, uh, for the expo coming up in a few months from now. Um, also, given the fact that that also will be, uh, as you just uh, said, uh, an, an online event uh, and not an on-site event, unfortunately. 
Um, but I think that meetings like these, um, they, they do make clear that it does also provide an, an opportunity uh, to, to come together and maybe also have people join that normally would not be able to make such a meeting. Um, and well, I'm very happy to present an overview of um, the, the research work that we are doing in the context of um, applying SNOMED CT, um, especially researching SNOMED CT in its OWL representation and how that contributes to uh, realizing uh, FAIR data. And well, thinking about how to um, visualize and structure my presentation, I thought, well, I might as well put the OWL in the web. Um, and I have the five topics uh, aligned here that I will go through, not necessarily in uh, clockwise order. Um, for brevity, and uh, Susie already did that uh, largely, I'll start with uh, briefly introducing myself. Um, well, this was already uh, mentioned in the introduction. I'm based at uh, Amsterdam University Medical Center in the medical informatics department. <clears throat> and well, some things to mention. Um, so what's my background? I wouldn't say it's a conflict of interest. I would say it's an interest. Um, I've been involved with uh, SNOMED International uh, for over the, the last decade in various uh, committees and advisory groups. Um, I'm currently chairing the GoFair executive board and um, the work uh, I will also uh, elaborate on has received funding from the European Union. So, um, well, let me not start with SNOMED CT. I will dig into that a bit later, but let me start with uh, FAIR data. So um, there's a lot of talk about FAIR data and it's important to realize that um, it all relies on the FAIR guiding principles, which, uh, well, as the word says, are principles. So the challenge with FAIR findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable data is how to turn it from principles into practice. And if you go through the principles, and I'll summarize them in the, in the next slide, you'll see that, um, well, basically it is a lot about um, what, but not about how. So any decisions on how to realize this are open for, well, uh, discussion, interpretation, and implementation. So it's not said that there is only one way in which you can realize fair data. I think the only thing standing out here, if we look at the principles, is globally unique and persistent identifiers. So that means that whenever you use something that you can, well, globally and forever, um, determine what this identifier refers to. And all the other things are more or less, like I said, open for discussion. So if we look at a bit more uh, summarized version of the principles, you could say that findability is about having metadata and data that should be easy to find. Um, and that's both for humans and for computers. And that's what I think one of the strengths and hence also one of the challenges of the FAIR principles to make sure that we include both humans and computers in the developments that we undertake. Um, and I think everyone doing research on, um, well, in the domain of healthcare and, and looking for data will have experienced that it's hard to find. And there's no easy way uh, to determine who has, uh, well, let's say data on COVID-19, uh, what data do these people have and um, can I, uh, under what conditions can I use these data? And according to the FAIR principles, then first you should be able to find that there is some data somewhere. Then um, you should be able to establish uh, whether you, and how you can access the data. And that may include things like authentication and authorization. Um, interoperability, uh, the aspect that you need to be able to integrate the data with other data and to be able to interoperate with applications for both analysis, but also for further storage and processing. And interoperability is of course the aspect where ontologies like SNOMED CT come into place. And if you have made your data findable, accessible, and interoperable, then you should also provide information, so metadata, 
on things like licensing and provenance so that anyone who builds upon your data knows under what conditions they are able to share their results. So this is where um, Creative Commons licenses can come in play, for example. So um, I know I have a tendency to focus on the interoperability aspect of FAIR, but it is important to realize for me and for everyone that FAIR is not only inter interoperability, but also findability, accessibility, and reusability. So, like I said, the FAIR principles describe the what, but not the how. Um, and interestingly, so if we look at globally unique and persistent identifiers, um, I think there is a lot that can be learned from the, the linked open data approach. Um, here's two examples of identifiers, which I hope will be persistent and which are identifiers for me. So one is my ORCID, uh, my author ID as a researcher, and my uh, LinkedIn ID. And well, it's unique because there's uh, only one of these links. Uh, so one <laughs> LinkedIn slash in slash Ronald Cornett. And if you, in this case, resolve this identifier, you end up on my LinkedIn page or on my uh, research page. So, but the FAIR principles don't say that you should use URIs, but like I said, there is a lot to be learned from the, the linked open data uh, approach, and that's what we see in the lower right corner. Um, so FAIR data could in principle be PDFs as um, open license documents, and um, I think there are FAIR infrastructures in which there are also PDFs being made available, and well, on the one hand, you can say, well, okay, is that fair? But on the other hand, you, you made your data at least findable, accessible, reusable, then there's work to do probably on the interoperability because really, well, digesting or dissecting information from a PDF may be hard. So the so-called two-star open data is if you provide your information in a structured form so that it gets better computer readable like an Excel sheet. Um, but then Excel is a proprietary format. So uh, the next step is to make it structured and open as for example, comma separated values. Um, but comma separated values can basically be still anything. So to come and that contributes to the globally unique and persistent identifiers, it's suggested to base it as much as possible on URIs, so unique resource identifiers. And if you make sure that those URIs indeed um, resolve and refer to other sources, then you can ultimately realize linked data. And depending on the licensing and uh, the access rights that you put on it, it can be linked open data. But, and I'd like to stress that once more, um, it's not said that everything in FAIR data should be um, in this uh, URI-based linked data approach but it is one of the areas um, in which there's a lot of research done and where, for example, SNOMED in its OWL format fits in. So one of the questions brought up uh, in advance of this uh, presentation was, so, um, well, is, um, is SNOMED FAIR? Um, and what people may often think is that FAIR data implies open data, but if we read the FAIR principles, it says that you need to be explicit about your access rights. It doesn't say that whatever you make available should be available to everybody um, without any restrictions or something like that. So I could have a data set that, uh, that I protect, but still I can make my, the, the metadata for that data set available. And of course I should provide some, some means for people, for example, to reach out to me if they would be interested in performing analyses. And one of the things coming along in, in the FAIR approach is that you do the so-called distrib or um, federated analysis. So someone would perform or I would perform analysis on someone else's behalf on my data rather than sharing my data for someone else to do the analysis. So the fact that something is not fully open doesn't imply that it's not fair. And um, so, well, while you can say that not all of SNOMED can be used 
uh, by everybody for each task. Um, yeah, that's true. And like, if you want to use Nomad CT for clinical data capture, that requires a license. Uh, but there's a global patient set available for uh, exchange of patient health information. And research on SNOMED luckily is uh, very well catered for, among others, uh, by SNOMED CT being part of the UMLS. So, well, while you can say not all of SNOMED can be used by everybody for everything, much of SNOMED can be used uh, by many people for many tasks. And I think that's what goes here is something that, that goes for FAIR in general. It's not black and white. Uh, FAIR is a spectrum from, well, data that can't be found and that can't be understood and used to data that is, well, extremely findable, well-organized, or rich metadata and how rich we can always discuss, discuss about richer metadata. Um, but in that spectrum, I think, well, like I say, SNOMED can be used for many tasks and the larger part of SNOMED can be used for that. So if we look at data, uh, because well, we, we want to, the FAIR principles are focusing on FAIR research data. Um, I point out a couple of links here for you and when the slides are shared, uh, you can follow these. Um, I think there's a number of interesting approaches here. Um, so on top, we see the, the FAIR data point website that provides reference to other FAIR data points. Um, and I think I'll just show what, what it looks like um, to see uh, for all. And then I'll briefly discuss the others. And I'll move in. Yeah, so here we have, and this is a, a human readable rendering, but we could easily also view this in a computer readable rendering. Here we see a bunch of FAIR data points that are shown to be active. Um, and that can be accessed by simply following links. So Vodan, that is the GoFair uh, viral outbreak uh, data network. Um, if we go there, we get information on uh, data available and repositories stored at the Vodan FAIR data point. Um, so this is the metadata about the Vodan FAIR data point, but here we can follow the link and um, we'll hopefully see what's on it. Yeah, so there's a demonstration of the WHO COVID uh, case report from catalog. So that's the catalog we can look into. And in this catalog, there's one data set, currently the ACME hospital. So this is work being developed um, that we can then enter, which is distributed as text, as turtle. I'll get back to that. And we can zoom in and we could even download it here, but I won't do that now. So here we see how as humans, we can click through this to get from a collection of fair data points to a data set within one of these data points. But of course, well, if we can click, uh, machines can follow links, um, they can index this and they, they can make this searchable for us. Um, other initiatives that, that are, well, like I say, more or less fair, that take up on elements, that, that work on rich metadata for the resources they, uh, they contain, are fair sharing, open air, and a special one that I'd uh, like to elaborate a bit on, um, Odyssey. Um, because Odyssey is a, also a federated research network focusing on uh, observational data. Uh, some of you may have seen a presentation of Odyssey in what well, I think it was the Vancouver meeting of the SNOMED Expo. Um, and in this uh, federated research network, uh, people harmonize their data so that you can indeed do uh, federated analysis by generating uh, analysis scripts that are spread in the research community and from which you can then harm collect the, the data aggregate and present. So various approaches uh, all contributing to one way or another fair data. Um, well, I talked about OWL and SNOMED, so I'd like to address that. 
Well, often when we talk about SNOMED, it's about the numbers, uh, the number of concepts, the number of relationships, the number of descriptions. But now I would like to focus on what's under the hood. Um, and this is, uh, well, coming from the Netherlands, um, well, there is, this is the focus that SNOMED functions under the hood of the EHR to support people in uh, unambiguous data capture. But, well, we can also look under the hood of SNOMED CT. And under the hood of SNOMED CT, we find OWL. And I think that's really um, a great step forward. What's OWL? Um, it's a semantic web language uh, used to represent, well, rich and complex knowledge, such as things, groups of things, uh, relationships between them. Um, it's, and that's really the strength of OWL, a logic-based language uh, with very strict semantics. Um, where the ontologies provide classes, properties, individuals, and data values, which are stored as semantic web documents. Well, I briefly addressed the link to open data. I will address some of the semantic web um, after SNOMED. And well, the important thing of OWL is that you can, well, really express complex and all subtle ideas about your data. Um, so you can be very precise, as I said, according to very strict semantics. And it helps in fast and flexible data modeling and in efficient automated reasoning. So if we look at the role of OWL in SNOMED, it's important to realize that, uh, well, like a year ago, until a year ago, um, we had a so-called um, structural subsumption mechanism um, and a representation in uh, release format two that you could convert to, uh, to OWL. So the core release of SNOMED was the concept, the relationship and the description table. And then there were transformations available. Already, well, years ago, I think 10 years ago, uh, there was the OWL script uh, that was uh, developed by uh, Ken Speckman. And um, more recently, an OWL toolkit has been developed um, that supported the transformation from release format to, to OWL. But this approach had a bunch of drawbacks. Um, first, that the, the things that you can express in release format two in the, the let's say the common tables, the, the concepts, uh, descriptions, relationships table, uh, the, the expressiveness of those tables was limited. And that meant that certain types of knowledge that you would need in your formal representation of the knowledge uh, was implicit and was actually added by the transformation scripts. And that were the role chains, and I'll, I'll show some examples later, uh, the transitivity of relationships and the reflexivity of relationships. So what it basically meant was, okay, if you look at the SNOMED tables, um, okay, everything that's in the tables is, well, like true and part of the, the definitions of the, the concepts, uh, but there are some things, part of the definitions of concepts and properties that are not in these tables. So that is suboptimal and given the limited expressiveness, um, we've worked for, for quite some years and I was actually quite happy that I was able to, uh, to, to be part of that process um, to transform SNOMED into such a way that now OWL is basically the leading representation uh, for the ontology from which the same tables, uh, the concept, the uh, description relationship table are derived. And that means that we can do a couple of things in, in the OWL representation that we could not do. And in theory, it means that we can take full OWL expressiveness, and I will not go into detail on that. But in practice, what, what has been established is the use of multiple axioms, role change, transitivity, reflexivity that I mentioned earlier, and generalized concept inclusions. And I'd briefly like to go over those. So one of the important things of multiple axioms is that you can say, well, there's actually two ways to define what a product containing known and epinylestradiol is. Um, I'll abbreviate that to 
product, I think. Um, so one is that you can say, well, this product is a subtype of a, a medicinal product that uh, plays the role of a contraceptive therapeutic. Um, and basically, so this is the, the primitive definition. So of course, there's other things needed to, to make this the product containing the substances mentioned. Um, but there's also, and that's actually what's in the second equivalence definition, saying that a medicinal product that contains these two uh, ingredients is actually the product containing, well, D and E. Um, and that's important because now on the one hand, you can infer from any product that you would post coordinate uh, or that you would define as a product in uh, an extension of a snowman ontology, for example. Uh, if it has these two ingredients, it will automatically be uh, categorized as a product containing D and E, but it will also be seen as a medicinal product that plays a contraceptive therapeutic role. So having these two uh, axioms for this one concept is uh, extremely useful and powerful. Then role chains, um, and well, forgive me for the numbers, but that was uh, a bit of uh, a matter of brevity, where we can say that um, having active ingredient, um, which is a modification of something um, that is a role chain uh, leading to having active ingredient. So if it has an ingredient, which is a modification of something else, then also that something else is considered to be an ingredient. And this axiom, um, these role chains were not in SNOMED. They can now be made explicit, explicit in OWL. Transitive object properties like is modification of, if something is a modification of something that is a modification of something else, then the, the first thing is a modification of the last thing. And reflexive object properties, basically saying everything is a modification of itself. So it is very useful to have this made explicit in the axioms in the OWL file, because any reasoner that you would take to infer over the ontology would take these into account. And otherwise, it, well, you could miss out on these. And you would have to update the script if you would introduce new um, object properties that were, for example, transitive or reflexive. Then the last thing um, of the extensions that have been made, a, and made uh, available in the OWL representation is the generalized concept inclusions. Always, I think, one of the properties that uh, people may be struggling with. And um, well, they're indicated by the, well, mirroring, so the other direction in which the subsumption symbol is presented. So what we see here is hypersensitivity condition is a type of clinical finding. But it also says as a second axiom, and so here we also see the, the, the value of multiple axioms, a disease which has a pathological process, which is a hypersensitivity process, is actually a hypersensitive, hypersensitivity condition. And similarly, a propensity to an adverse reaction, which has a realization, which is a hypersensitivity process, also is a hypersensitivity condition. So this provides three ways um, or three axioms about this hypersensitivity condition. One, what it is, and two, what combination of axioms are subtypes of hypersensitivity conditions. And that is, um, again, extremely valuable. So OWL has now been the, the, the core of SNOMED CT. And then sometimes people ask like, okay, but I don't see uh, an OWL file in SNOMED. And that is because OWL is released as a so-called reference set um, rather than a file. But well, the strength thereof are that um, in a reference set, you can version your OWL axioms. And in pure plain OWL, that's something that is actually hard to do. So like all of SNOMED is, is versioned in release format too, and you can basically create any release uh, up to the most recent one. If you have the, the full version of the ontology, you can do the same um, 
for the OWL axioms. It maintains the release format to infrastructure. So any organization that has set up this infrastructure um, basically gets the OWL reference set in it for free. And it's very easy to create the OWL file, for example, using the OWL toolkit from Snowman. So I talked a lot about OWL and um, well, that is a very important part of what ultimately forms the semantic web in combination with um, the linked open data approach. So if we look at the semantic web, there's a whole bunch of standards that are needed. Um, OWL for ontologies, then Shex, and I take it as an example, I know there's also Shackle and there may be others, for clinical data modeling, um, which can be represented in the Shex C syntax or in any of the resource descriptor framework, syntax C's, RDF, and to represent data, there is RDF. So the way to describe instances. And again, here there's a whole bunch of instances. Some are better human readable, others may be better for machine readability, um, but all of these, um, well, syntactically different, but semantically the same. And these contribute to the, the data layer in the semantic web. And well, I will get to RDF. I have discussed OWL in the context of um, SNOMED. So I'd like to elaborate a bit on checks for the data models or clinical data models. And one of the things that I was uh, really happy to see and um, well, work that has been pushed forward, I know Harold Solbrick among others is involved in that, is that to create those shapes um, as they are called in the semantic web uh, lingo. Um, this approach is being uh, adopted by HL7 in FHIR. Um, not natively, but it does provide a Shex representation where you can specify things like permitted attributes for patient, for example, uh, including cardinalities and including allowed values. So as you see here on uh, well, build.fire.org, uh, you can find the patient Shex specification. So this is again, uh, fully compliant to one of the semantic web standards. And if we zoom in, then, well, we see a couple of things. So a patient has um, a patient name, which is one or more human names. Patient has um, a gender, which is a code uh, coming from some um, administrative gender value set, a fire value set. And well, to explain in this um, file as examples are given, so that can be male, female, other, or unknown. And a patient can optionally, that's the question mark, have, well, at most one birth date, which is a date. And the value sets is one of the, of the other, I think, important elements to contribute to building this uh, semantic web. Um, and well, also great to see how, how FHIR implements that. So I'll follow that link and see where it takes us. So here we have the administrative gender, the gender of a person used for administrative purposes. This value set includes codes from the following code system. And well, if I wanna know, okay, which codes are in there, I can go there and I get to the administrative gender value set and going through it, I see, okay, so there's code male, female, other, and unknown. Well, that's exactly what was mentioned in the comment in the shape definition. So, in the semantic web, we have OWL for ontologies. We have something like Shex for shapes, so for data model specifications. And as I said, there's RDF for instance data. And the important thing about RDF is that, um, again, it focuses on, well, hopefully persistent, uh, globally uh, persistent identifiers, um, which are URIs. So I could say um, that, well, 
this is again uh, an identifier for me. We have an identifier for the HL7 fire patient gender, um, and I can specify my uh, gender as coming from the fire code system, administrative gender, administrative gender, male. So here's a triple basically saying Ronald has gender male. And here is the same triple saying exactly the same thing, only taking a different identifier for my, me as a subject, predicate gender, uh, object masculine. And again, we could follow all these links and they would all take us to web pages, providing us with information about these resources. Now, of course, we get to the challenge that we have two different ways of saying exactly the same thing, Ronald has male gender, um, so, or masculine gender. So that is something that we need to overcome. Um, and what we need for that, so we need ontologies, we need the data models, uh, we need the value sets to pick our values from, but we also need ontology alignment services and instance alignment services. So we need to be able to express that uh, HL7 owl, uh, HL7 male is the same as SNOMED male or SNOMED masculine. Um, and we need to be able to express that HL7 administrative gender is well, more or less equivalent to SNOMED gender. So we need ontology alignment for that, uh, which is exactly what the system like the UMLS Metathesaurus does. That's also what Athena provides, the vocabulary of uh, the Odyssey Consortium. But, well, there's always more ontologies than, than you can map in a static fashion. So one of the things that we're also looking into is uh, doing uh, dynamic mapping using uh, tooling like Agreement Maker Lite, uh, Formal Concept Analysis, or LogMap. Tools that provide automated alignment uh, between ontologies. And the other thing we need to do is instance alignment because, well, if at one place I use my LinkedIn identifier and another place uses my ORCID, we would need a service such as uh, same as where we can basically say, okay, the LinkedIn Ronald Cornett is the same as ORCID with the number. So all of that is needed to establish this interoperability and to be able to see equivalence at the data and at the ontology level. And of course, we also need things such as data access services that deal with, with authentication and authorization. So I tried to lay it out in a bit of a architecture sketch, what we would need, <clears throat> and the legend is on the left. Uh, we need ontologies like SNOMED and many others. We need value sets that describe relevant values uh, for certain contexts like administrative gender. We need mappings between ontologies. We need data models that describe which are the relevant attributes for, for a person, for an observation, maybe specifically for a blood pressure observation. Um, <clears throat> and we need to be able to do reasoning over those ontologies on the individual's data being stored in electronic health records, in registries, or in electronic data capture software. So this is basically what shapes the infrastructure of the semantic web in, well, in healthcare. And having OWL ontologies in place is very important there. So um, one is, well, one of the general reasons for doing, um, for applying ontologies, for example, that you can enrich your data. And if I know that someone has a viral pneumonia, I know this person has an infective pneumonia, I know this person has a lung disorder, and so on, and so on. There's a whole bunch of more generic uh, information that I can, can infer from that. But it's also important to be able to apply reasoning on instances. So for example, if I have a patient with an infective pneumonia and COVID-19, um, I want to be able to infer that the patient actually has a viral pneumonia where the causative agent is the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So OWL is not just for, let's say, um, creating the, the inferred form of SNOMED and then walking away. You also need OWL to be able to infer over the information uh, 
provided within patient records. And that takes me to um, a couple of use cases that I would uh, like to go through um, and see how we have tried to apply, well, either FAIR approach, SNOMAD, uh, semantic web technologies to contribute to furthering uh, various projects. And I have a couple of uh, use cases I'd like to go through. Um, one is the European Joint Programme on Rare Diseases, in which 35 countries participate, 26 from the EU, um, where we are now working on really selecting and combining all these semantic pieces to realize a so-called virtual platform um, through which we can interconnect fair rare disease data. In the approach here, we're fully basing us on the semantic web technology. So we are really going all the way down to, to RDF, uh, modeling in checks, uh, picking the proper ontologies, including uh, ORDO, a rare disease ontology, NCI thesaurus, uh, CO as an ontology for, um, uh, well, well the, that's the semantic interoperability ontology, which uh, provides a whole load of um, especially properties. Um, combining all those to create that virtual platform to be able to do the federated querying over rare disease data. And currently our research there focuses on a couple of things uh, among others, uh, how to establish high quality RDF data because, well, um, creating RDF triples is one, but making sure that, that they do indeed, uh, that they are correct, uh, complete, uh, that uh, URIs being used resolve and, and other things is actually more challenging. So, um, and people may have experience with a, a tool like Protege, which I think is a great environment for doing uh, ontology engineering and to some extent also for some data capture. Um, but, well, you, you would want to be able to do this also in a machine processable way. So we're looking at ways to do that. And as I pointed out, as you have this whole bunch of ontologies, you need to be able to align them. And um, not all ontologies are in the UMLS method thesaurus um, or are in things like BioPortal, ontology lookup service, and you name them. So we need to be able to do that on the fly or semi on the fly as well. So we are looking into the ontology alignment tooling. Some other use cases uh, closer to home in Amsterdam. Uh, we have a project uh, which is uh, within our university medical center called Adam, um, which focuses on the, on the problem list because, well, we do have, uh, we, we use EPIC in our medical center, uh, which has a problem list, which is populated through a Dutch interface terminology uh, called the diagnosis thesaurus, but there's still challenge to, to get that complete. Um, and we're trying to see, so how can we improve the user interaction and how can we support users in, in actually reaping the benefit from having the patient findings uh, captured adequately in the problem list. And we're also using that for, <clears throat> excuse me, for assessing the completeness of the COVID-19 cohort, because we have to, we are mandated to report on uh, COVID-19 patients in the Netherlands, which happens. But the question is, do we find them all? So we are now looking into these records to see uh, the completeness of that national reporting. And we're looking into to ways of doing medical entity linking so that we can link free text to um, SNOMED CT concepts. And also in the context of uh, COVID data, we are, we're partnering with uh, other groups at Amsterdam, uh, UMC, UMC uh, harmonizing the data of Dutch COVID-19 patients, which are now merged into a single data warehouse um, where we try to establish as much as possible the use of, um, well, LOINC and SNOMED for coding uh, observations, uh, lab data, but also kind of for representing the clinical findings. Um, trying to do that in, in, at, let's say, at the end of the line in the single data warehouse, but also try to, let's say, 
push that back into the source systems because, uh, well, if we can increasingly make these systems have structured data, it becomes increasingly in, uh, easy to harmonize the data. And currently that isn't the case yet. And we do this by realizing, well, currently a centralized Odyssey compliant uh, fair data point that we're building but we can imagine that if we uh, can do the centralized data and represent it as an Odyssey uh, repository, um, that we can also, and especially if hospitals get their data more properly coded and um, well available in a structured way, each individual hospital could ulti ultimately become uh, its own fair data point um, providing descriptions of data and can set up an infrastructure in which the healthcare data can really play a role in, um, well, healthcare quality analysis and in improving the quality of healthcare. Then there's a European project that we just started this year, uh, working on a coaching system for improving the quality of life of uh, cancer home patients. Uh, where we work on harmonization of cancer data from the Netherlands and Italy, not because there's overlapping patient cohorts, but because we want to be able to uh, basically bring these sets together, together for analyses and also to provide an infrastructure for uh, providing decision support, for example, um, which works in, in both cases in, this, in, in the same way. So there we also apply the Odyssey approach for data harmonization. Um, but there's a whole lot more going on there. Um, there's data exchange between the source system and uh, the repository, between the repository and um, tools that the patients may use at home, like monitoring devices and uh, mobile apps, um, for which we will use HL7 Fire, among others. Um, and in the context of this project, we're also looking into, um, well, possibilities of reasoning over instance data. So where the larger part is focusing on the Odyssey approach, uh, we're also looking into the real semantic web technologies, uh, providing OWL reasoning over instance data, like I just showed an example, uh, to support what's called Sparkle querying. That's basically the SQL for semantic web. So we need to bring those together. And, and that's uh, the last use case, and then I conclude. Uh, we're working with both an EHR vendor with a shared PhD student and an EDC vendor with a shared PhD student, um, where we try to reap the benefits of using the SNOMED CT hierarchy, the properties in SNOMED and uh, patient-friendly terms related to uh, the SNOMED concepts. Um, to, for example, in patient portals, um, well, enable a more understandable uh, representation of patient records. And especially in Dutch, I think that's important because our layman medical terms are very different from the, the medical terms used by the specialists. So such a, these patient-friendly terms are very much needed. And because you don't, want or may not, it may not be easily able to transfer or translate everything or provide everything with a friendly term from SNOMED. Um, we're looking into ways how we can reap the benefits from uh, generalization and things like that. And that's a collaborative project with our Dutch ICT Institute in Healthcare, NICTIS also. Um, and then with Castor who do electronic data capture and uh, provide tooling for that. Uh, we are working on making research data fair right from the start so that if you specify your data set and you specify your metadata, um, you basically establish a fair data point from the start so that you can share or make your data shareable uh, and make your data and the existence of your data known to others. So to summarize, um, there's basically Two, and of course, like I said, it's a spectrum, but maybe on, on the both sides of the spectrum towards fair data and metadata. Um, there's the approach rooted in semantic web technology like RDF, Shex, and OWL. Um, and there's the approach where you grow from harmonized models and vocabularies like uh, Odyssey has implemented. And I think both are great, both bring in their own value, and hopefully in some future elements of one will get to the other and the other way around. 
And in these approaches, ontologies are among the essential metadata. Um, so there's much more metadata is it, well, would be a talk in itself, but ontologies are a crucial way to provide meaning to whatever is represented uh, in the data. And SNOMED CT and the, the role it has taken, actually SNOMED was one of the drivers for a lot of development in computer science in, in developing reasoners that could cope with ontologies the size of SNOMED CT. So I think SNOMED has been a great driver of um, expressive owl ontologies, um, really contributing to reasoning of the EHR data. And well, all of these are pieces of an infrastructure that is being uh, established and uh, well, where we are, uh, among others in the projects that I just described, are working um, towards integrating to see how this can all help to uh, well, ultimately uh, make research easier and contribute to further improving healthcare. And with that, I'd like to thank you very much. And um, well, I think the floor is open for questions. That was absolutely awesome. Thank you so much, Ron. And yes, we definitely have some time for questions. Um, so what I'll go through um, is uh, the list. I, I've been keeping a list as the questions have been coming in. And um, I will unmute you so that you can talk. Um, so the first question comes from, and I'm sorry, but it's listed as Galaxy J5. Um, I'm going to unmute you and I apologize that I don't have your name listed here. So you should be able to unmute yourself. Maybe, if not, I'll move on into, I'll let Galaxy, um, work out their technical aspects right now. So I'll move on over to the Q&A box. Uh, so we had a question from uh, Lisbeth from Netherlands. Um, so let me find you in the... Lisbeth, you are able to talk. Yeah, do you hear me? Yes. Yes, I do. Okay. Well, I had uh, two questions. Okay. One is uh, how is the uh, Snowman City aligned with uh, LOINC? Because in Netherlands, uh, all the laboratories use the LOINC, which is very, I like, uh, very nice uh, classified codification, global codification. And uh, it should be clear how the two are working together or not. That's yeah. one question. Yes, yeah, good question. question. Ron, did you want me to field that one? Uh, yeah, you may do so. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Great question, Lizbeth. So um, a number of years ago, uh, back in 2017, we actually did create the um, uh, sort of a mapping file. It was to link from link parts and link terms to SNOMED CT expressions. Um, it is from uh, several versions ago, so it is a little bit older uh, file, but um, this expression mapping um, can still be utilized as a baseline to start, and then you can customize for your own needs. So um, just to also reassure you and others on here, we are, you know, continuing to have our discussions with uh, Regan Street the uh, creators mm -hmm. of Blink. We are actually yeah. really good friends and um, we are continuing to talk about ways forward. So hopefully soon there will be some other way to link as of right now that uh, 2017 file is the most up-to-date direct way to link the two. Okay. Yep. A second question about COVID. Um, uh, of course, it would be very interesting uh, to know which features uh, are aligned with, or linked with the positive or negative COVID RNA test and viral load specifically, for which I know there is a loin code. Uh, how uh, how is this? Uh, how are you going about this? Because the Dutch uh, uh, GGDs, <laughs> private mm -hmm. uh, public health, is collecting all the data but not in a computable computer readable way 
for example, one could use, for example, ICPC, another classification, and link it with um, the positive test or negative test. Uh, and uh, there is a difference is in people who are registered in hospitals and outside. Many are tested also outside hospitals. Yeah, so um, I, I think that's a, a great question. And I think that's actually one of the, the, the very challenging issues. And um, I've, well, already within hospital is challenging. Um, recently, I, I saw a um, short um, paper describing, I think, 12 or 13 ways and places in the record in which uh, a description can be given that this is a COVID patient. Um, so, so you would really have to um, take all of those into account. And I think ultimately, um, well, what you would need is to be able to, to determine those ways and to uh, process the record uh, really in a smart way. And I, I actually think that, uh, well, having uh, the capacity of doing uh, reasoning and it can be applying rules, but that can definitely also be in uh, our reasoning is um, is crucial to be able to to solve that because um, what how I see it happening now COVID is one of the examples which really shows how much we need to adjust mm -hmm. things um, but if, if we solve it all only for COVID it, it will be a matter of time that something else comes up and we would have to do everything all over again. And I think we, we really need to look into systematic approaches to solve that. And well, like I think providing rules, uh, providing reasoning, um, providing ways to detect equivalences, um, that's really what we need to get in. Um, and first within um, the a system and then also across systems because indeed one of the challenges will also be to be able to uh, well exchange information uh, between live systems containing patient information. Um, also um, Lisbeth I put in and this is for everyone on the call I put in the chat box a link to the SNOMED CT data coding um, guide and this essentially provides uh, some guidance on uh, current SNOMED CT concepts that can be utilized when you're trying to encode um, particular data related to COVID-19. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and um, thank you for those questions, Lizbeth. Um, I'm going to move on. Um, Sander Mertens looks like also has a question. Just give me a moment to do a scroll through my all right, so Sander, you should be able to unmute yourself. Yes, I think that worked. Uh, Ronald, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I missed the first 10 minutes of the presentation, unfortunately, so maybe you mentioned it, uh, but I'm very interested in the owl reasoning. And do you see any value of owl reasoning over expression constraint language? And if so, could you uh, elaborate on that? Um, yeah, thanks for the question, Sander. Um, so, what? Well, I think the expression constraint language um, can't help you in like uh, detecting equivalence or in in doing the subsumption for you. So, um, expression constraint language, I think, is, is a great tool for creating uh, value sets, um, but. I, or, or I'm now mixing up the cons expression constraint language and the query language, sorry. Um, so the, the, the query language you would use for, um, for, for defining value sets and um, expression constraint language. Um, well, like I said, I, th that has a number of drawbacks. So in expression constraint, I can, I can indeed say, okay, this is a patient uh, where, which, which has the, the viral pneumonia caused by um, uh, the COVID uh, NCOV, SARS NCOV-2. Um, but you, you really need the, the, the reasoning capacities um, to, well, establish um, equivalences to establish all kind of inferences, and I think ultimately uh, expression constraint does not uh, does not do the inferences for you. Sorry, 
sorry about that, I was muted. Um, in the about one to two minutes that we have left, I'm gonna see if we can sneak these last two questions in. Um, thank you for that question, Sanders. Uh, let's see, Charles, you have been given permission to speak now. <laughs> Charles, Dr. Guthridge. Uh, thanks, Susie. Um, uh, great presentation, Roy. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ron. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'm sort of interested in uh, how you see strategically we might influence the big uh, enterprise developers of EHRs to um, use, uh, I guess, both SNOMED CT and the semantic web more creatively than they currently do. Um, well, yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll try to be brief. So uh, <laughs> uh, sometimes I think, well, uh, the best way maybe is uh, to do it yourself. Um, so, so I've been thinking about that actually, if, if we could set up a, a fully semantic te uh, web technology based um, EHR, uh, to, uh, or at least as a proof of concept, but well, ultimately, you would want to to make that grow to to something that could compete. But I know that is probably overly ambitious. Um, maybe it's even the easy way. Uh, but the, so I think the hard way would indeed be uh, well get in touch with them, see what we would really need. So I think that the question that uh, Lisbeth just asked about being able to detect. Um, ways in which information can be represented in a record, uh, to really see that this is a requirement to really show that and how semantic web technologies can perform that. Um, and then maybe not even in the, in the clinical layer, but let's say in the warehouse layer, um, establish an RDF uh, semantic web representation where you can um, do that kind of inferencing. Yeah, thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, and uh, I see one final question from uh, Agnes, and just in terms of time, um, I'm just going to verbalize this one. So you're um, inquiring about um, mappings and if there are incorrect mappings between ontologies, um, how do we deal with those? So with regards to SNOMED CT products, so if it's a SNOMED CT to ICD-10 CM, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, 10 map that we create, go ahead and just email us at info at snomed.org to inform us of the incorrect mapping and um, we can work with you on that. If it's a mapping file that's produced by another organization, obviously we um, would encourage you to contact where that particular mapping is made. So um, just in terms of timing, um, I do want to be cognizant because we are running a little over, but that's because this was an absolute excellent presentation. Thank you so much, Ron, uh, Dr. Cornett, for presenting today. If you have further questions for myself or for Ron, go ahead and email me. My email is sro at snomed.org. Um, I will be emailing everyone um, with the link to this uh, recording as well as the slides when they're available later this week. Um, otherwise, I will see you all next month for next month's uh, SNOMED CT research webinar. Thank you so much for attending. Thanks all for attending and uh, thanks for hosting, uh, Susie. Yes. <laughs>